fair resume. John O, thanks for joining us. Look forward to doing this this year. Uh, g'day, Kane. Jared, how are you guys? We're going pretty well. What's uh, Tom De Koning worth, John O? Oh, wow. I caught the back end of that and uh, I nearly fell off my chair here in the study, Jared. That would be um, that would be enormous. But oh, what's he what's he worth? Oh, a couple of um, couple of first rounders or a first and a future, I, I would assume. If that's if yeah. that's the the route we're going down, and uh, and plenty of uh, plenty of coin to go with it, I would have thought. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Valuing those players who are going to get paid a lot but don't deserve it yet. And, you know, then there's many examples, and Gold Coast have had to deal with that. So those third, fourth players, high draft picks, have shown some potential but haven't got the runs on the board. I mean, look, Jackson's a pretty good example of that. Rankin's another one, 800,000, the yeah, thereabouts. There's, heap, there's heaps of them. It, you know, even Finn Callahan, we spoke to the Giants, Jason McCartney, about that and the, the prospect of them having to pay a six-game player. At that point, he'd played six games, Jono. So it, you are forecasting mm-hmm. forward, and it is a bit of a risk. Yeah, and we, we, we've all been through it. Kane, in terms of, you know, you, you'd show a little bit in terms of your career and you get rewarded with a two- or three-year deal and you, you, your wage would go up um, with that. So we, we have lived it. We understand that a lot of it is on the potential that the club can see you uh, achieving into the into the future. And, and now, you know, with these younger players, it's at a different level. We, we, we get that. And I agree with, with your sentiments around, um, you know, some that, that may get a little bit more than what they are actually worth at that particular stage of their career and whether that adds a little bit more pressure. But when you look at the Cats and their potential search for a, a significant Ruckman within their lineup, you know, in the years to come, then he feels that he would fill that role perfectly with, with Segler, you know, obviously going to step away at some point and Reece Stanley as well, that he becomes the next in. And, um, and I think he's going to be in the future quarter an important uh, Ruckman in the competition. Yeah. He was controversially dropped in the final round last year. And, uh, you, you know, they, they, they went with the side that they went with. He wasn't in the best of form last year, still a young player. But, uh, see, if you're looking at good, young, tall stocks around the league, uh, there's few as impressive as him. Oh, that's, that's right. And he, he has got that ability to go go forward and, and catch it. I think he'll learn to support defence a little bit more, which will then even add another layer to his game to work back first, um, you know, in, in transition. But, you know, ultimately... You know, it's it, the world's at his feet. If he wants to work hard and he and he really wants to, um, you know, put the yards in and, and and do some grind over a period of time, he'll he'll come out the other other side of it and be, you know, a, an exceptional player in this competition. Now, John, your mission tonight is to talk about the sides that were disappointing last week uh, and put that into perspective for us. But before you do that, Kane is enamoured with your old mob and the fact that they've got uh, four tools, three on the ground, one on the bench. Maybe they'll go four. All up. Uh, how do you see that un? un- uh, how do you see that unfolding? Yeah, look, it it could it could change the game, couldn't it? The way that we the way mm. that we view it, I, I think that you look at you look at the teams of the past, probably five or six years. They've all had a little a little trick up their sleeve that has separated them from the competition that the the competition actually couldn't couldn't stop. And I even go back to obviously 2016 when the Bulldogs were throwing it around by hand, and that um, that set them apart to to give them that opportunity to play in the grand final and win, win the flag. Melbourne with their run off the back half, um, off the back of the square and, and bursting through. That nearly got them into into that position, what Hawthorne were able to do with the cluster. And maybe this is it for the Bulldogs. Maybe it is the, the fact that if they can get their ball movement right, the, the talls will continually have an impact. You've got guys up there that are quite athletic that stand close to 200, all of the, all four of them. So, you know, they've, they've got that flexibility if, so, if one or two get injured as well along the way. And, I think they've all played a little bit horses for courses. If you're in great form, you're in, and um, there'll be matches where you might play a little bit, um, a little bit smaller as well. But it's a, it's one of those for the for the opposition. How do they go into it? You know, you've got the fourth, third, and fourth tall that you've got to match up on. Do you go with the mid size and hope they can bring it to ground so you can run it out? It it adds a, a few a few challenges for for the opposition if they're if they're up and going. Does it compromise their defence? And I premise that by saying, if you look at Richmond. Their defence is their big issue at the present time, ranked, uh, I think it was 12th in the league for defence. And I think a lot of it is to do with they've lost those role players who who were so valuable through their, you know, premiership uh, reign, like Edwards and Castagna, who were only retired this year, and Lambert, for instance. Uh, Butler's gone down to St Kilda, but, you know, they were all hard-running guys who could get that back and block up defence. 
Yeah, definitely. I think that's and that, that's a, a really strong point that you make, Jared. And it comes down to to whether it's Waitman and Vandermeer or whether it's Young Jones who, who might get an opportunity in the the wingers. Um, you know, whether that's Caleb Daniel pushing up a little bit higher, who can go back and and support in in those roles you're talking about. But when you're looking at particular matchups for these taller players, they're genuinely going to have a, a tall matchup themselves. So that that mm. defensive player isn't really going to put pressure on compressing the ground or, or things like that in a really sort of fast, fast sort of motion. So I think there's, I think it will play out both ways. I think the first four weeks of the year for the, for the Bulldogs will be quite interesting to, to watch. We'll all be keeping a close eye on it. And I think it really does start with, um, you know, their game against Melbourne with what uh, Gorn and, uh, and Grundy will do, whether Tim English can stand up in that role with, with a little bit of support, but then, you know, whether May and Lever and whether Petty can, can hold the three or four tools that, that they will have to counter. And it's, it's going to be intriguing to watch. What do you do with Melbourne? Like, how, how do you prevent them from marking the footy in the oh, back the, the way they're setting up, Kane, and you look at the, the practice game that they, they played against Richmond, you had Gorn go in the middle of the ground, then he'd work from centre back and then Grundy would work centre forward. So yeah. Gorn would go back, support defence and mark the ball. Um, and then start that transition the other way. And then you had the outlet kick or the rush kick out of defence down down the line, and there's Grundy, you know, conking them on the wing. And he actually did move quite well and, and led into some strong positions as well. So, look, for Melbourne, that's 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 going to be going to be a huge strength of, of theirs throughout the year. It's going to be very tough to, to combat, and I think sides will struggle with it at times. And you're going to have the, the players around their feet, Oliver and Petrarca and Brayshaw and... Even the wingman, who I think with Hunter and Langdon, that combination is going to be so strong throughout the, the home and away season with the amount of ball that they do get from defence right through to attack and their running ability. So all of a sudden, you've got the talls, but these mids are going to read it so early compared to the opposition because they're going to back Gorn in and they're going to be left the area before their opposition. So therefore, their transition will be a lot smoother and that's the advantage they will have as a, as a team. So let's get stuck into the sides that uh, struggle to... Impressed last weekend. Let's start with the Tigers. We already mentioned that. Last year, you know, without the footy, they were ranked 12, so the defence needs some work. Clearance is no good, and uh, post-clearance uh, contested ball also uh, below average. So they've tried to fix up the latter two by picking up a couple of guys from the Giants, but their defence, Jono, needs work. That didn't work on the on the weekend. The, look, the, the two guys that we mentioned and a couple of mids will walk away and say, yeah, we found a bit of ball, but but out of out of stoppage, especially in mid zone stoppage, they were they were beaten comprehensively from Melbourne. One winning that ball, but then they burst out of there. You know, Hopper and Taranto and even Cochin at times were just left watching. And I think more mentally for them, they, they should be hit between the eyes with that. But with their within their own game and assessment, they should be looking at that going. We didn't work hard enough once we lost that initial contest. And Petrarca and Oliver they, and, and Lang, they were just running through, breaking forward 50, you know, getting two and three possessions along the way. That's the area that they need to fix. Yes, they're, they're good names. Yes, they're good players. But unless they're going to go the other way when it's not on their terms, it's, it's going to be, um, you know, they're going to have some difficult moments. What about North Melbourne? We've touched on them. The news today, Ben Mackay is, is injured. There isn't a time frame for his return, but it doesn't sound great. Zerha, I mean, a couple of players so important for them and disappointing, particularly through the midfield against your dogs. Uh, what can we expect and what would be a good pass mark for them? Uh, I think the... No, he's putting games on it, I don't think. They, they could win between two and four. Some are saying they might win six to eight. I can't see that. But Jeez, two would two be bad, four. Jono. I, I, I keep hearing... We can't put games on it and, and look at percentage and things like that, but it, it, it's win loss, isn't it? I mean, two, two yeah, is no, we, dire. We, we understand that, Kane, but we we know what they produced last year. We know where they're at as a, as a playing group. We know what stocks they they do have. So, well, that's that's how many I can just see them yeah. see them winning throughout throughout the season. Um, and off the back of it's it's the small wins for North Melbourne. It's the improvement of you know, some players that, that may step under Clarko's guidance. And, mm. you know, you just... And I think it's more the midfielders that we will that we will probably see that in the early stages um, with. And whether that's a Phillips who can get some game time under his belt, whether that's Davies Uniac going to another level, we wait and see. But they just don't, unfortunately, at this point, have the have the manpower to, to compete consistently for four quarters. They played well in the first quarter against the Dogs. They played well in the last quarter. But they, they'll have quarters where they get absolutely blown out of out of the water 
which will um, put a dampener on things. But they will have some individuals that'll stand up and will go, okay, well maybe they're on on the right path here. Let's move on to the Gold Coast, who were almost the most disappointing side last week. They've promised a lot over summer. Uh, it's now yeah, or never no, no, many no, ways, no, but no. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where the improvement is going to come from, Jono. I, I, I hope that they can, but uh, geez, they're going to have to work harder without the footy than they did on the weekend. Oh, definitely. It was it was very disappointing. The GWS absolutely destroyed. And first bounce. What's Lockie Whitfield going to do? He's going to burst through the middle of the ground and get a handball received. You know that as an opposition, and they let it happen. First centre bounce of the second quarter. Same thing happened again. So. Mentally, they were, weren't switched on at all. And, and I think overall, they were completely out, outworked. And it, it did go to show, without Miller around the ball, why, how far they do actually drop away. Mm. And it was actually quite surprising to, to see that on the, uh, on the weekend. So, yeah, they've they got a lot of work to do to turn this around quickly. Normally, the Gold Coast Suns, their first six to ten weeks are yeah. competitive and hard and tough. And then their season drops away off the back of that. But after last year, everyone's sort of saying, well, this, this side needs to hang in longer in the season with a chance to play finals. I, I didn't see it on the weekend, so we wait and see what they can um, now produce in round one. Well, good test up against the Swans, who were ordinary themselves in the, uh, in the practice match hit out. Then uh, pretty solid. They, uh, they obviously got a little bit of uh, horse um, training over the, uh, the pre-season love, week, yeah. and uh, they responded fairly quickly. <laughs> They've got to wake up as to how... Hard you have to work. And that's the one thing you don't know in practice matches. You, you can go out there and you forget how hard it is to work. But, uh, I mean, Melbourne clearly were primed uh, and the Swans were primed last week. So the Suns may just need a little bit of uh, Stewie Jew treatment and uh, get themselves fired back up again. Well, they, they should they should be getting it after after that. And, and it would surprise me if if uh, Stewie Jew didn't go down that track as, as well. I know you hear these days they don't like to, you know, individual eyes or, or hit guys between the eyes, but that's the type of performance that you exactly hit, hit, the, hit the group between the eyes because it's, it's game on now and you can't serve up that again in round one. You lose all momentum for a summer of, of trying to improve and it becomes quite difficult from, from that aspect. So if, if he hasn't hit them between the eyes, I'd be, I'd be very surprised if we don't see a different competitive Gold Coast Suns in, in round one. I think we'll be shocked. Uh, any expectation on the, the Bombers, Jono? They've lowered it on themselves, but what about for you? No, not really. I, I still think that you know they'll, they'll probably sit in between that area of, of 10, to, 10 to 14, Kane. So, look, mm. the, they're, they're, they're hard to pick, the, the Essendon Footy Club. I think they'll, they'll have some games and they'll blow an opposition away, but I still think they'll have weeks where they, they really battle against the, the better teams in the competition. I don't think they're there yet to to get themselves to play uh, finals football. More importantly, not even just get there to win finals footy. And that's what you want to do. You want to, when you actually make that mark, you want to be able to um, claim that first finals win. And I don't think they're, they're there yet as a, as a club. You know, Brad Scott will certainly change the dynamic of the way they play. I think, um, you know, we'll see players definitely improve under, under Brad Scott, but I still can't see them winning enough games throughout the season. What about the Blues, Jono? Uh, their biggest trick last year was all about contest, uh, p- post-contest uh, clearance and clearances themselves. Um, but they need to find other ways to uh, hit the scoreboard. Yeah, they, well, it's, and it's it's bizarre we say that, isn't it? With the strength they do have in the in the forward half of the forward half of the ground. But once again, you look at a, t- a side. I think they just rolled out against the Swans and probably expected it just to, the switch to go on, and mm. you know. We'll, we'll get we'll get the job done here, or we'll be able to compete against the Swans. And you know, their 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 players from maybe 15 to 22 on their on their particular on their list in that game didn't uh, didn't perform up to standard. When you look at the Swans and their players in 15 to 22 had absolute crackers and a and a cherry ripe to go. This is one where you know Michael Voss will um you know will drive home over the over the next couple of weeks, and it won't be just in around, you know, the development of the group and, and what they need to be, you know, continually working on. It'll go back to the basics of the game for Vossi. We, we've known him long enough, Jared and Cornsey, that he thrives on, on the three aspects of the game and contest is number one and, and he'll wind them up to, um, to be ready for, for the Tigers. And a lot of people in Adelaide wanting to know your thoughts on Port Adelaide, but I did hear you say they're just going to miss the finals. We're about out of time, uh, Jono, but we look forward to doing this each and every week. um, And we'll see you in the studio next week, mate. Thanks for your time. No, no worries. Have a good night.